Welcome to our event. Take a deep breath, relax, enjoy, settle in for what I hope is going to be a fun afternoon and good ride. It's great that you're all here for the 25th anniversary meeting. Um, for reasons that are obvious, these days before I give talks, I take the opportunity, since I have the podium, of reminding us all of a particular feature, namely that we live in interesting times, and unfortunately not in a good way. And because that's the case, it's maybe uh, we can, before we indulge in the fun of science and debate, we just take you know, a brief minute to remind ourselves what the issues are. And, and just to summarize them briefly, I selected some quotes that, that help me contextualize this. One is something I rather like by Albert Einstein. The world is a dangerous place, not because of those who do evil, but because of those who look on and do nothing. So whether you're young or old, do something. Hey, don't just sit by. It's too, too important a time, too interesting a time to do nothing. Um, a different intellectual from down the street, although he, I think I, he's taking up golf in Arizona, said, it is the responsibility of intellectuals to speak the truth and to expose lies. And that is true, and we are the people who are ostensibly trained to evaluate evidence, speak truth to power, and be honest. So, as a reminder, as all, regardless of where you are on the political spectrum, it behooves us to be aware, informative, teach, and so on. Okay. So today, as you know, outside of the hotel, if you were aware, the uh, March for Our Lives went on to deal with gun control. So, yes. So whatever it is you do and whatever it is you care about, you know, pick a cause. Do something, don't just stand by and do nothing. That's not enough nowadays. Okay, enough of the school marmish reminders, even though I think they're important to me. So let's get into our uh, big data versus big theory afternoon. And um, very, we have a wonderful cast of heroes uh, for the epic battle. And um, so let me say a few minutes before we get into this. To, in, the neuroscience, the systems neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, there exists an orgy of data. I mean, there's no question about that. Um, and we now have to figure out, do we need more big theory to provide more infrastructure or not? So to debate this and to give their perspectives, we have four researchers with expertise in quite different areas, in neurophysiology, neuroimaging, artificial intelligence, language research, computation. And they will argue for what they think is the most likely way to get new explanatory insight. And we look forward to that. So let me give you the three slide summary of where things are, if you're, depending on which field you come from. So for instance, there's a nice summary of a very short history of big data in an article from a few years ago, which has the very nice one-liner, data expands to fill the space available. Well, that's not a very good reason. So just because we can, we should, so that's not super helpful. 20 years later, um, Steve Bryson and colleagues published an article in the communications of ACM um, summarizing, and these are people in, you know, coming from computer science and computer uh, engineering, the purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. I, I rather like that quote. But so these are people coming from the engineering world and we can summarize their stance over the last few years as let's say skepticism. That's good. So what about um, more neuroscience colleagues? Well, there's a nice paper um, by Sejnowski, Churchland, and Moffshin, putting big data to good use in neuroscience. That sounds very um, promising. They talk about, for instance, one obstacle is that sometimes theorists do not clearly convey what they propose, perhaps because they seek safety in needlessly complex mathematics, or because they're too remote from the experimental base to undergird their theoretical ideas. So they take a more optimistic stance. So, so far so good. 
But then you can take others. You can take neuroscience colleagues like, let's say, Yves Freignac in a lovely paper called Big Data in the Industrialization of Neuroscience, a safe roadmap for understanding the brain. And he uh, addresses three questions. Is the industrialization of neuroscience the soundest way to achieve substantial progress in knowledge about the brain? Do we have a safe roadmap based on scientific consensus do these large-scale approaches guarantee that we'll reach a better understanding of the brain? You can anticipate from the way that he asked the question that his stance is one of nihilism. <laughs> so we have skepticism, optimism, nihilism, and this afternoon we'll have a debate, and the question is, what will you think is? So hopefully we'll come to some interesting conclusion. And at stake are some ideas like the concept of description, explanation, prediction, understanding, mechanism. Um, to give you a flavor of how people think about this, the physicist David Deutsch, in a very influential book, The Fabric of Reality, said to say that prediction is the purpose of a scientific theory is to confuse means with ends. It's like saying that the purpose of a spaceship is to burn fuel. Passing experimental tests is only one of many things a theory has to do to achieve the real purpose of science, which is to explain the world. Interesting. Let that you know, reflect on that as you complain. Okay, peeps back there. Lots of seats up here. Come to the front while I'm blathering on. Come, 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 come. There's like 10 seats up here. Good ones even, really good ones. Okay, so who are our heroes this afternoon? The heroes of the debate are first Eve Martyr. She's gonna speak first. A, couldn't be more distinguished neuroscientist. Our second hero, Jack Gallant, an equally couldn't be more distinguished neuroscientist. Our next hero is Alana Fish, an about to be super distinguished neuroscience, cognitive scientist and computationalist. And our final hero, Gary Marcus, a distinguished cognitive scientist and not yet neuroscientist. These will be our four debaters, and uh, the order of operations is something like this. Each person will give a brief presentation, 10 minutes, not more than 15, because then I'm gonna take their mic away. Uh, there can be very short questions of clarification, and if the answer isn't punchy, I'll cut you off. And then there will be vigorous, vital, clarifying debate between the cast of characters. And then there's hopefully a long opportunity for the audience to give questions, comments, whine, complain, make better suggestions. That will be followed by Mike Kazaniga's keynote on the consciousness instinct, for which you're supposed to stay in this room. And then cocktails. Does that sounds, good? sounds like a very good afternoon to me. It ends. Okay, so the first speaker is um, Eve. I was first asked to do this meeting, I sort of said yes when I wasn't paying attention. And then I kept on getting emails and I said, I can't do this. I don't know anything about either big data or big theory. So then I wrote back and I said, I can't do that. Um, so what I can do is give you my sense in 2018 um, of the continue, what I would call the continuing importance of the small for understanding the big. And I think we're at a very interesting juncture right now, which is what I'm going to try and um, go through with you. Um, I've been a, a frankly reductionist, small circuits, um, electrophysiologist, and computational neuroscientist for many years. And I keep getting stuck at what it would take for me to understand any of the big data that you guys are all generating, what I would call understanding. So that's what I'm gonna do. We're gonna do a little bit of a confessional mode. Um, so basically the question I'd ask all of you is how much ambiguity can each of you live with in your attempt to understand the brain and what constitutes understanding? I personally can't deal with the ambiguity of something more than 100 neurons, I get stuck. Um, probably my, my husband, who studies language, lives with having to try and understand the whole human brain. And we manage to live with each other, so it's okay. Um, so I imagine I'd really be able to talk with many of you. But 
but actually, I think we all select problems and techniques and modes of living in the world and doing science really on the basis of how much ambiguity that we can tolerate. And, you know, I'm being a little facetious, but I'm not really being facetious because um, knowing where one puts the black box and how much you feel like you have to open up that black box to understand the dynamics of all the inner, the inner workings is really, really important. Now, I'm going to sort of give you my sense of what's going on today, um, of what's going on. So the trade-offs between big and small data and theory of large and small networks. So I don't see any tension between theory and experimental work. I think most anybody who's really going to understand the dynamics of circuits has to be able to do both or collaborate with people to do both or um, think about how to do both. Um, and some principles of brain organization will only be seen with large data methods. So, for example, I, I, would be, I believe completely that you need really good connectivity data, who's connected to who to understand any brain, whether it's small or large. Um, you need to be able to do simultaneous recordings from multiple neurons and multiple brain regions. Um, because only seeing a little piece of something, if you really want to understand dynamics, doesn't work. Um, and then obviously correlations of gene expression across neurons and brain regions is going to be really, really important. Um, that said, um, building models, and maybe we'll get into an argument about this, but as far as I can tell, building models of large numbers of neurons means either you use reduced models that sacrifice biological principles, and we, that's probably fighting words for some of you. Or building models that are as incomprehensible as the real brain, and that's probably fighting words for others of you. But I actually believe both of these things. Um, now, on the other hand, building models of small numbers of neurons allows the implementation of biologically plausible cellular and synaptic mechanisms, but potentially sacrifices insights into dynamics that can only arise from large networks if there are any. And I remain unconvinced that there are dynamics that only arise from large networks because anytime I ask someone how a large network works, they always tell me a small circuit kind of answer. So that's another set of fighting words we might have. Um, then I'm just going to run through some features of brains that are important for animals in the world. Um, neurons and brains are constantly rebuilding themselves as components as ion channels and receptors are constantly turning over. This allows continuous plasticity but requires continuous balance of stability and plasticity mechanisms. I'm not going to talk any more about that, but it's something that us cellular people worry about all the time. Um, neuronal mechanisms tile time, so a lot of the multiple ion channels and receptors that we have allow us to work in many, many, many time scales. Um, and then we have parallel pathways between neurons create multiple routes for information flow. And this is something I know that many of you worry about. But I'm just going to show you one data slide right here. It's a theory data slide. Just to, um, and some of you may have seen this, this was a paper that was published a number of years ago, and it's a five neuron model. So these are simplified um, Morris lacar like models, it doesn't matter. Um, each one of them is, a, is an oscillator. And there are two, two fast um, neurons, one what we'll call a hub neuron, and it can flip between firing with the fast or the slow oscillator, and the last two, S1 and S2, are two slow oscillators. And then what Gabrielle Gooder is, who did this work, she started out with the HN neuron, if you look at it, and it's firing a time with the slow neurons. And then she changed one of the synaptic strengths, and now she flipped the HN neuron to firing in time with the fast oscillator. And then she flipped a different synaptic strength, and she was able to produce the same change in network dynamics. And then she flipped still a different synaptic strength and she was able to produce the same change in network dynamics. So this tells you in a network as simple as five neurons, which has parallel pathways because of those electrical synapses that you're seeing as resistors, there are what we'll call degenerate mechanisms, that is to say, multiple mechanisms that are completely separate and completely different but can produce basically the same change in circuit behavior. And if I were a cognitive neuroscientist, I'd be really worried about this because this, to me, is the nightmare of trying to understand complex brains. 
Now, neuromodulation changed properties of cells and synapses, sometimes drastically, but really causes circuit crashes. Now, when I say neuromodulation, I mean putting on a substance that changes the intrinsic properties or synaptic strengths in the network. That's not at all what many of you call neuromodulation. So I just learned, finally, um, that neuromodulation has two entirely different meanings in neuroscience, and I find that really horrifying. Okay. Now, then, just another little example of something that was very, very important to us when we found it. There are many, many solutions to producing good enough circuit function. This is the other side of what I just showed you. Um, but these will be differentially sensitive to perturbation. So this is continuing in that theme of multiple mechanisms. So this was a little computational model. It was actually a big one at the time. This was large data in 2004 when Astrid Prince built this model. It's a three-cell circuit, and she ended up building 20 million versions of this three-cell circuit with different combinations of parameters in each one of the versions. And then she selected from the 20 million those that produced a good behaving, what we call pyloric rhythm and 400,000 of them met those criteria. So this was a complete paradigm shift in how to build a semi-realistic model. Instead of trying to hand tune, we just looked for all models that had certain attributes. And when she did that, she found here, you see, two, two versions, and they had completely different underlying parameters, and you can see that in the bottom two panels. The two circuits are doing basically the same thing, or very similar to the same thing, but all of the parameters that went into these are quite different. And I was incredibly excited when we got these data because it was very reassuring as a biologist to know that some of the variability in what we measured might have been real, and theorists started giving me all this hard time. And the hard time came in many, many versions, but the one thing that they were right about they said that model circuit one and model circuit two would behave very differently to perturbations because of their underlying different param differences in parameter structure. And then I said, well, that's true, but the question is, would they behave differently to the perturbations that my crab where the circuit comes from would see? And as we've done now 12 years of work trying to understand the consequences for circuit resilience and stability of the variability in the biological data. Now, I'm just going to show you one last data slide. These are data of rhythms from five animals, and you can see they look very, very similar. But if we were to go in and I show you the values for all the parameters that give rise to these, they're quite different. But now we do a perturbation, and we remove all the endogenous modulatory inputs. And you, here's animal one, here's animal two, animal three, and you can see their control values are quite different, and what's even more different is how they respond to temperature. So what we're seeing here is that the perturbation reveals cryptic underlying structural differences, and these individual animals under some conditions have very, very, very different resilience to an important perturbation. And I'm gonna just, finish a tiny little bit and just say, brains constantly accrue change by virtue of experience. You all know that. This means that brains are never stationary, which is really annoying for both data analysis and theory. Um, and that means that return to baseline behavior is always hiding change that may be cryptic under most conditions, but can be manifest under others. And I would be worried about this if I were you also. And then, and here's the thing that most preoccupies me right now. Stability over a range of environmental perturbations and stresses almost always requires multiple cellular mechanisms that protect the system against loss of function due to single time scales and single cellular processes. Um, and then animals, you, my crabs, have to deal with many unexpected life challenges. The nervous system can't, and now this is really important, the nervous system can't optimize for one situation if it makes animals unable to deal with all of the other challenges they're likely to encounter. So anybody who's looking at optimization about any process, I think you're maybe a little delusional. Because it means that you know all the different things that the animal has to, or we have to be optimized for, which you don't know. I know you don't know. Okay, and then, Animals vary, people vary, 
And this is the question that most preoccupies me right now. Are there hard trade-offs between resilience to one perturbation and to others? Do you have some animals, some people, who are just good at dealing with all perturbations? Or is there, if you're good at dealing with temperature, for my crabs in the ocean, does it necessarily mean they're bad at dealing with changes in oxygen tension? And so, and in people, if you're really good at dealing with one kind of situation, does that necessarily mean that there'll be others that you may not meet in your life if you really are good and stay away from them, um, but that we really have to think about the hard trade-offs and optimization in a totally different way. And I'll stop there. <laughs>